So uh, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, this is basically a keynote speech and the speaker is Professor Prashant Balwari from uh, uh, University of Edinburgh, UK. So let me, it's my pleasure actually to introduce Professor Prashant uh, to the audience. So Professor Prashant Valuri uh, received his PhD in 2004 in chemical engineering from Imperial College London. Uh, his research focuses on tackling uh, industrially relevant multiple flows with uh, phase change using bespoke numerical and theoretical techniques. So this includes uh, stability analysis to understand interfacial instabilities and DNS for combined heat mass momentum transport such as flows with phase change and flows with mass transfer and interfacial reactions. So he's a professor, as I already told, uh, in uh, fluid dynamics and the chair of UK-wide multiphase flows and transport phenomena, special interest group under the UK Fluids Network. And uh, he's a PI aperture Hector ECSE 0804E174, uh, several projects, and he led development of uh, the ultra first high resolution uh, two phase level set uh, code version three and uh, also the Jerry Simmer solid solver version one. So these solvers have been employed to gain an understanding of fundamental phenomena during phase change cooling of microelectronics. He is the coordinator and PI of the five continent thermos, thermosmart project funded by the European Commission in which India is a major contributor with participation of TIFR, ICTS Bangalore, along with uh, 19 other major international participants. So it's my pleasure and I'm really looking forward to listen to Professor Valuri. The, his, the title of his talk is Multiphase Flow Speaks the language, Speak the Language of Instability. So we are ready to listen to you, Professor Valuri, and we are ready to know the language of multiphase flows. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bakshi. I'm still trying to decipher the language, so this is just an attempt. So uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank all of you for inviting me to this uh, great, uh, great ISHMT series. And I think, I think this is a very good thing. Uh, if it was not for the lockdowns and all that, I would have been in Chennai now, because I've got so many friends, I've got so many collaborators back in India. So I usually come during this time to actually work with them. <laughs> so unfortunately, where we are is where we are. So this is so this particular talk I focused on in terms of multi-phase flows. I'm going to give you some examples on how you can actually capture instabilities and make them actually work for you in terms of uh, in terms of interfacial flows, in terms of flows with force phase change. One of the things I should mention is you can see the names in blue. The sorry for the big author list, but these are this is just my way of giving tribute to all my PhD students. So the people in blue are basically PhD students. And then you've got a whole host of collaborators right within the University of Edinburgh from Professors uh, Khalil Safian, then Omar Matar from Imperial College, uh, Jungo Kim from University of Maryland, Lennon Onore from Dublin, George Karabetsas from uh, Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. I've got a huge collaboration with Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center because there's a lot of parallel computing involved. Uh, I, I need to pay tribute to Peter Spelt, uh, Matthew, Leco, uh, Matthew Luko, uh, Jenning Wong and Kita and uh, Takata Sensei from uh, Kyushu University, then uh, Professor Zaleski and Professor Potpine from um, from Sobon University, and Rama Govindarajan from uh, from ICTS uh, TIFR, whom, with whom I've worked for a long time now. So uh, very quickly, uh, I'm going to be talking about basically what what is instability. So basically, you can have uh, stability any small wave, any wave can be either stable or unstable. Okay. If it is growing, it is unstable. If it is not, if it uh, if it is not, it's basically stable. Okay. Or it could be neutrally stable, where the height of the wave remains as it is. So this is usually captured using the two D model linear stability analysis. So the first thing, first example I can give you is the Kelvin Helmholtz. It's a very simple one. You have seen these clouds all over the place. So this is basically constructed because you've got a high velocity air uh, beneath a low velocity current. And then you've got these scattered formations all over the place. So this is the Kelvin Helmholtz instability, and that is driven mainly by the uh, mainly by the difference in the velocities. Okay, so it's, there's not much of viscosity influence, but it's the velocity influence. Of course, the most imp the other important thing is which is driven by the viscosity. So if you have a two-phase system, you will have two different viscosities, and the viscosity contrast 
is the one which actually drives the instability. So this is basically an example of an oil and gas pipeline, for example, or a water and oil system, or any sort of, I mean, multi-phase systems are there throughout industry, all over the place. So in any of these systems, it's basically key. The key influence of this driver of the instability is the viscosity difference between the two phases, okay? So that is the E instability. The other thing is obviously, when you go to higher Reynolds numbers, you have, uh, you have the shear modes or the tall mine selecting mode, uh, and basically, these are the, if I can see the show this, this is the tall mine schlichting radius, which, which disturbs the boundary layer. And these are the guys which actually cause, uh, cause a lot of instability. So in any two-phase flow system, especially in turbulent flows, you will have an interfacial mode driven by the viscosity contrast. And then you have a tall mine schlichting mode, either in phase one or in the phase two. So you will always have three components which are running together. They compete with each other to, test, uh, to actually cause flow regimes and all that. So, so they are different. The other thing is obviously miles instability. This is uh, influenced mainly from the critical layer. It's usually at very high Reynolds numbers and very high fluid numbers. And then you can have a Phillips mechanism wherein, uh, wherein this, there is a direct forcing because of the turbulent kinetic energy, okay? So there are various ways in which your, uh, uh, in which your waves can be generated in, in any flows. So one of the things is the characteristics of these waves. So obviously these waves, they can either actually flow together or sometimes they contaminate the whole field. So basically you can have something called as a convective instability. So this is a convective instability where if you start a wave at this point, it will only keep moving in one direction. So it only moves in the streamwise direction. But then this is the usual convective instability mode. But then you can also have a very weird mode, which is called as an absolute instability, where the, the motion of the flow is towards the right. Motion, is, motion of the flow is towards the right, but, uh, but basically your, uh, your waves actually also travel towards the left. So it's basically contaminating the whole field. This is what, is called, this is what happens usually in, in some systems. And you need to be really wary about where these systems occur. This could be occurring due to thermal, uh, thermal disturbances. This could be occurring due to velocity disturbances, you name it, okay? So you need to be really aware of within your engineering system, what type of instabilities is, what type of instabilities and what is the characteristic of the instability? Of course, there can be also be, as I mentioned, you can have several, several ways by which you are driving your instabilities. You can have viscosities driving them, you can have temperature differences, you can have all these things, but all of them can sometimes contribute together. And that's when we sometimes, we sometimes use something called as a transient, more, uh, transient growth instability, uh, transient growth. So, we, uh, so we, we do something called as transient growth analysis to actually tease out which one is the driving mode, okay? Which one is the driving mode? So you can have, you, and, and these, these different modes can actually collaborate with each other to rapidly destabilize the system. So basically, so these are the methods that we look at. These are the methods, the stability analysis is the methods that we look at to tease out different types of instabilities and also to understand how, how, how a system can behave non-linearly as well. A, so usually you can have two types of systems. A two, one system is where you have a base state, where you have a steady state. So it's like a flow in a pipe. A flow in a pipe can have a steady state. Uh, you just write down your um, Navier-Stokes equations, you can have a steady state, uh, uh, you can have a steady state system. But of course, flows are never steady. So all you do is you basically work on a base state and then, uh, and then perturb the interface and you can do a stability analysis. But then in reality, what you have is you have flows systems without a base state. And these are systems where, for example, you've got phase change. So obviously if you have phase change, your system doesn't remain. Your drops don't remain as drops anymore. They just evaporate into space, okay? They evaporate into space. So basically you would have all kinds of problems uh, when you have systems without base state, okay? So what do we do in terms of stability analysis? Normally we start off with a base state or a kind of a pseudo base state. I'm gonna to come to that in a minute. And then what we do is we give a small wiggle. We give a small perturbation uh, of this form. So this is a normal mode perturbation that is usually given. Now, if you look at this carefully, this is exponential. So epsilon is the smallest kind of amplitude you can imagine. It's in the, it's much below the smallest order of the grid size or much below the smallest error that your experimental apparatus can capture. So it is 10 to the one minus nine, for example, okay? Uh, alpha X and beta Y, these are the growth rates in the X and the Y direction. So if X and Y are your uh, span wise and stream wise directions, then X uh, alpha is the growth rate in X, beta is the growth rate in Y. So these are the spatial growth rates. And then obviously waves also grow in time. So you have also have the, 
omega t here. So this is the growth rate in time. Omega is the growth rate in time. So your waves can grow both in space as well as time. We put this perturbation in. And once you put this perturbation in, we can linearize the system and we get something called as an Osmofel type equations. It's an eigenvalue problem. We solve for the system. When we solve for the system, we don't solve the uh, flow of the system. We just are looking at the points where stability is affected. Okay. It just gives you a map. It gives you a map in. Uh, it gives you a map in your space which says that, okay, this is the region where you will have instabilities. This is the region which you where probably you will not have any instabilities. So that's what it only determines. So the Orsomerfeld analysis only determines the zone of stability for any system. It doesn't tell you anything else. It may tell you the type of instability and all that, but it doesn't actually tell you what exactly happens. And how you determine that is basically you determine using DNS. So once you do DNS or experiments, you will actually come to know how these how these instabilities manifest themselves, okay? Uh, whether it's a non, or you can do a nonlinear stability analysis, but if you do DNS, you will get all the picture at the same time, okay? So obviously within my group, we do a lot of DNS flow solver development. We, uh, as, as, as the chair already announced, uh, we, we have developed something called as a TPLS solver, which is very widely used nowadays. Uh, we can use it for stratified flows, slug flows, all kinds of things, phase change we are doing. We're also doing for interfacial reaction and contact line problems. So this can have two different types of methods to capture your interface. You can have a level set method or a diffuse interface method. Each one has its advantages. I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. We also actually have developed uh, something called as a Jerez immerse boundary problem. So this is for uh, solids inflows. So you can actually look at, you can actually simulate solids uh, tumbling in flows in, in uh, uh, tumbling together in flows and understanding what the dynamic how the dynamics can influence them so at this point in time i would like to also pay tribute to professor peter spelt who, who who passed away sadly last year so because of him actually we started developing tpls long long time ago in 2009 i would say or 2007 i think exactly uh, but unfortunately he's no longer with us so he was there uh, from the inception of tpls and now it's used about uh, in 53 countries all over the world Okay, so let's give, let me start with an example. So if you have a steady base state system, so if you look at any type of uh, two phase flow system, you can have all kinds of regime transitions. You can have a kind of a slug flow, you can have a plug flow like this one, or you can have some kind of a, a annular flow where you wouldn't have, you have a gas, gas center and then a liquid film on the slides and you can see all these waves being transmitting all over the place. Sometimes in most cases you will have mixtures of them. So this is basically a churn flow system. Okay. So you can have different types of systems in, in case of multi-phase flows, as you already know. In some cases you will have ligaments which actually tear off from the film and then actually you can have these uh, wavy stratified formations as well. Okay. So the idea is that you can have a stable state. These flows they can, in principle, in theory, they can have a steady state, but obviously these instabilities don't allow that to happen, okay? So what do we do? So essentially what we do is we look at, uh, we look at the uh, usual governing equations. So we look at the, this is your usual mass, mass balance continuity equation. This is your momentum balance. And you can see that there is, uh, this is the surface tension term. So sigma n is basically your surface sigma kappa n is the surface tension term. And this is, this is usually there if you have a gradient of surface tension. This happens when you have uh, temperature influence or concentration influence and so on and so forth. You can also have, obviously the interface is defined either by a level set function. So essentially you want to track the position of the interface. Uh, and, and basically the properties of the phases are dependent upon the position of the interface. Okay, so this is, this is nothing, really, uh, nothing really advanced. So this is the standard method which is used for uh, simulating two phase flows, especially with level set method. The other method that we can actually use is the diffuse interface method. Here C is the volume fraction. And what we have is an interfacial peclet number. Now, this is basically extremely beneficial if you have a contact line problem. So basically this avoids contact line instabilities and you can have definitions based on Van der Waals forces on how exactly the contact line behaves. You can actually get your volumetric free energy. And then it is very similar to a WOF method, I would say, but then you can have advantages that you can actually use it for contact line problems. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a simple Two phase flow system, you've got an upper layer and a bottom layer. And what we'll do is we, we, we put a forcing to the interface here. And as you do the forcing, you'll see that you will have these evolutions of these waves. And this is a combination. What I'm going to argue about is this is the combination of a two dimensional instability in combination with the three dimensional instability. Okay. 
And obviously you can have a, the, the, governing, the governing thing would be either the Reynolds number or the inverse capillary number. Okay, so what do we do is we solve the system. So you can see that this is a, in this video, you'll see that you initially start off with a, uh, you initially start off with a simple uh, kind of a wave, but then very quickly, you'll see that there is a three dimensional structure to this wave. You can see this kind of an S type of a instability coming up. And you can see that one of these, few of these waves will actually start competing with each other. And they actually merge sometimes. <laughs> And, and basically, uh, basically you develop tongues and ligaments and all that. So these are extremely dense simulations, but they're actually showing you the physics of the process. Okay? They're actually, you can actually look at, um, you can actually look at how your, uh, uh, how your waves behave together. So in this case, what we do is we look at the, we look at the spectra. So this is how, uh, this is how your wave will actually evolve. This is the principal mode. But then if you look at the further modes, you will actually see that there is a lot of activity going on. So if you look at the streamwise direction, you will have the uh, third mode, which is actually picking up at a later stage. This is the weekly long neuron linear instability kicking off. And then if you look at the spanwise, so this is the spanwise, this is in the, in the Z, uh, this is in the Y direction, you would say. So you can see that there is a particular growth, but then you would also have another pickup at some point here. So this is a uh, this is a this is a third harmonic which is picking up to cause the contamination of the whole thing. So if you look at it very carefully, if you look at it these if you look at these modes very carefully, you will find that both of these modes actually collaborate with each other to develop a tongue. Okay. So essentially, what you can do is by doing this analysis, you can actually look at what are the modes that are causing these waves, and if you if, in your system if you don't want to have those waves you can you can make you can make adjustments either on surface tension either on other things so i'm going to come to that in a second so obviously you can see that what would happen i mentioned that you can control your system using surface tension for example if you want to avoid these combinations of these modes so one thing you can do is you can actually if you increase your surface tension if you increase your surface tension rather than having these flat tongues you will have these ligaments okay so if you want to if you want to reduce the formation of tongues but rather have ligaments that's fine when do you need ligaments for example if you want to develop a drop wise flow if you want to develop more and more drops within your flow then probably best to have high surface tension and let your reynolds number run and then you will generate more and more droplets in your flow so it will, it will generate a lot of mist if your engineering system demands that now in case of for example if you keep increasing your reynolds numbers you what you end up is basically a turbulent flow no, it is a turbulent interface. So essentially, I should mention here, we are not solving any turbulent equations. We are just doing DNS. But essentially, what you're getting is you're getting chaos, which is predicted by DNS, which is basically interfacial turbulence. So you can get out from here interfacial kinetic energy. You can get turbulent kinetic energy on the interface and so on. So you can do a lot of stuff in terms of uh, an analyzing these flows in depth. Okay, so again, as I mentioned, if you increase your, if you decrease your S, if you decrease your surface tension, you can have long tongues rather than filaments. But then one thing you can do is you can actually look at the curvature of the interface. So here I'm plotting a space time plot of curvature of the interface. So initially you start off with a small wave. So this has been there throughout the time. Okay, but then these waves actually evolve. So, so you can see these curvatures being going like this, but at some point these curves, these curvatures become so high and they start merging with each other. So you can see that there is one merging point over here. And this is what was captured in your stability analysis as well. Okay, so, so this is basically an important aspect for understanding what happens if you have, uh, what happens if you have a, uh, different types of modes. So for example, if you, have a, if you are operating your system in an absolute mode, you will actually see that the number of frequencies, number of ligaments that are generated, the number of ligaments that are generated corresponds to the frequency of the most unstable mode or the saddle mode frequency of the mode, okay? So this is one example. The other example is about falling films. So in case of falling films, what you have is you, you use that in absorption and distillation towers. So these are there in any chemical industry. Uh, if you look at them, these are filled up with packings. Within those packings, you can, have, uh, you can have these structures. So you can see that the gas is going up and you have a liquid film which is flowing down. So essentially what you want to do is maximize the interfacial surface area so you can maximize heat and mass transfer for these systems, okay? So what we do is, so here is a slightly idealized system. 
So you can see there is a wetted wall. Okay, this is a wetted wall and you've got a film, boiling film running down. And this is the area where your gas is going up. And this is operating at a very high flow rate. So, so these are operating at almost industrial standard flow rates. Uh, and, and this is where the packing manufacturers operate their designs in. And this is usually called as the loading point. Now, if you look at this, what, happen is, what is happening is the liquid actually is flowing down, but you can see that the waves that are developed on the interface, they're actually traveling upwards. They're not traveling up, the energy is being transmitted upwards, but actually the liquid is going down. So this is a classic, this is a classic case of absolute instability, wherein the entire system gets contaminated by waves. And in fact, the manufacturers want you to operate in that zone because that is when you'll have more waves. That is, if you have more waves, you will have better heat transfer area and better mass transfer area. So this is, this is one of the regions where you want to operate your column in. Okay, so obviously you can actually do again, uh, you can actually do a space time plot and look at how these waves evolve. So you can see these waves which are evolving. You can see merging of waves in these regions, et cetera, at later times and all that, just standard. If you compare it with the linear stability analysis, so basically uh, this is your, uh, so the dotted line is your stability analysis, the growth rate of waves with the stability analysis. And if you look at the blue line, you can, the blue line actually predicts very closely about two orders of magnitude growth, okay? So this is this is very very good in terms of uh, actually relaying your relaying your simulations and theory back to industrial uh, scenarios. Okay, so basically you can have uh, you can do many such uh, many such simulations, and you can actually propose that okay, if you want to maximize your heat transfer or maximize your wave production or maximize your interfacial area, then you can operate in in a certain range and so on. Okay, so these have been published. So you can look at my papers in JFM and Physics of Fluid. This was this was quite a while ago, but you can you can have a look. Um, the other example I would like to talk to you about is cases where there is no phase, there's no base state. So basically, this is where you have evaporation coming into picture. So obviously, in a system which is evaporating, you don't have any base state. So basically, you can have. Uh, so this is an example of an experiment where your methanol drop is evaporating, and as it evaporates, it generates the thermocapillary instabilities. And when we do a, a quasi-steady stability analysis, so wherein what we do is we freeze each base state in time and then, op then operate a stability analysis, we actually, we actually get something very close. We actually do get these instabilities that are predicted, okay? okay? So, but what happens in a real system? In a real system, in your spherical, I mean, droplets are never spherical. You, you always have all kinds of weird shapes, okay? Even if you have a spherical drop, they will exhibit three-dimensional phenomena. The moment that you have got these azimuthal instabilities means that you don't have any axis of symmetry. So essentially, it's a three-dimensional system. So we can do a similar kind of a system with, with full DNS. So you can see a drop, which is put in a gas. You can have all kinds of dimensional growth groups. I won't go into depth in this, but you have the similar set of equations. You've got uh, the interface equation, you've got the mass equation, etc. All these bracketed terms are there when you have a phase change. Okay, so if you don't have phase change, these bracketed terms, these uh, uh, these box terms, will not be there. So this is basically uh, uh, this is basically due to uh, phase change between mass and uh, between liquid and vapor. S being the rate of phase change. You have the uh, you have species transfer in the phase uh, in the gas phase. If you have phase change, obviously, if you have ethanol evaporating in air, you'll have ethanol species in air. And similarly, you'll have energy transfer. Uh, you've got the phase change energy transfer here defined by the Jacob number. Okay, uh, you've got a very slow phase change model. This is basically a simple Raoult's law. There's nothing really great in it. And then, as I mentioned, when you do a, a diffuse interface method, you can you can really take into account the contact line dynamics simply by using a contact line boundary condition. So when you specify your when you specify your contact angle, you're sorted. Okay, so if you look at um, so if you look at this, this is the preliminary two D cut of a three D system. So you can see that everything is predicted as normal. You don't have this is the temperature plot here. Uh, this is your mass transfer. This is the mass fraction plot, and this is the internal waves with the internal velocity. Plot, okay. Now, if we do the experiments, we have done experiments, so we can just simply deposit a droplet on a copper substrate. Uh, and we just see, it's just water with time. And you can see, this is your infrared image. Okay, you can see that this is basically uh, evaporating in that certain way. And we, when we compare against numerical simulations, we almost predict the same thing. So you've got the dark line, the, the black line is the simulation. 
and then the, uh, the blue line is the experiment. So we are very close. We know why there is a difference here. That's because the, in the experiment, you can't really have a fixed uh, contact line. It will always move no matter what you do. But we can see that the numerical evaporation rate is very close to what we have experimentally observed. Okay? So this gives us some confidence. And this is some more data. Now, what happens in 3D? So in 3D, if you have a different type of shape, what you'll have is you'll have this emergence of these sudden emergence of these azimuthal waves all through the droplet, which is very, which is very unique because we had this was not seen before. Earlier, people used to imagine that this is symmetric and all that. And obviously, symmetry goes out of the window if you have systems like this. And now we have done further work to emphasize why this is completely real. Uh, so if you look at the experiments, so this is how your experiments look like. So this is basically a uh, basically an infrared image from the top. And you can see that you've got these patches of cold, uh, cold regions here. And if you look at DNS, we also predict the same thing. So it's not very, very far away from what your experiment is predicting. Okay. So obviously these are submit, these are um, these are uh, these are available in JFM as well. Uh, the other things that we have done recently is about looking at binary droplets. So what happens if you have uh, if you have ethanol with them. So you've got competing evaporation and we are doing now stability analysis for the system. So what happens if you have ethanol is you can see that, uh, I'll try to play this. So you can see that as, as, you, uh, as you deposit the droplet, what you will have is, um, sorry. Yeah, uh, what you will have is you'll have this sudden, uh, sudden sudden development of these waves. And these waves can actually uh, cause kind of something called as an octopi instability. So these are octopi instabilities that we are looking at. So there is a combination of both thermocapillary as well as solutocapillary instabilities that have happened. So we've done this for uh, ethanol water. We have also done some aspects of work when you have salt deposited in the system, okay? When you have salt deposited in the system, so you've got hygroscopic aqueous solutions, we've done that. We have also done some things. So normally when we look at uh, phase chain systems, some people use PIVs to actually look at how these particles are moving. My always worry, my worry is that the PIV particles should not interfere with flow. And that's what we wanted to look at. So with Rama Govindaraj and what we did is we looked at, uh, we looked at these particles, how these particles can tumble, okay, within any system. So in this case, uh, we were looking at chaotic orbits uh, of tumbling ellipsoids. So these chaotic orbits can be obtained no matter what the instability is. This could be a thermal instability or this could be a disturbance within the flow of the system. But as soon as you give a certain kick, and if your solid is of a certain kind, you will develop mixing and you will develop actually uh, chaos within your system, okay? In some cases, chaos is good. If you have these particles stumbling in a chaotic manner, they can help with your mixing, okay? In some cases, they are not good because they are, if you're using the particles to measure something, then actually they will start interfering with your system. So that's when you need to be very careful. Okay. So just to conclude, uh, so we have done it. We have looked at phase change flows, and we have looked at non-phase change flows as well. In phase change flows, you can get kind of azimuthal instabilities in non-spherical droplets and even spherical droplets. Actually, you can have a complex contact angle distribution all through the droplet. And if you have binary mixtures, they they demonstrate remarkably different behaviors. You can have phase aggregation. You will have these spreading and non-spreading as well. In case of in case of non-phase change stuff, you can have three-dimensional waves that are developed due to uh, due to transient growth. Okay, you can also have a you can also have ligaments. You can have sheets. You can also go into interfacial turbulence. Okay, and finally, you can also have in case of vertical contact current flows, you can also have absolute instabilities that can kick off your system. Okay, so a quick thing. So stability analysis can help to give you the basic first point first viewpoint of your system, but your physics must be correct, okay? Uh, DNS will be able to help you look at the uh, flow pattern very carefully, but again, you need to really be careful on what you're looking at, okay? So the most important limiting factor is post-processing large chunks of data. I can tell you in 2009, when 2008 and 7, when we developed the solver, uh, I used to take about 40 days to obtain one result. Now we can obtain the same result within a few hours. But the amount of data that we get is about uh, 100 gigabytes. And, and actually looking for the correct data is it takes more time. So it's post-processing large chunks of data is something which is very important and which will take a long time. 
Okay, so you, we have actually uh, we have actually uh, written a chapter on using um, using both uh, stability analysis and DNS to actually look at your systems. You can have a look at this. So finally, a big thank you to all of you and my collaborators as well, and of course my research group. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Prashant Babri. And uh, the floor is now open for questions. I have a lot of questions, but uh, okay, I will let others to ask first. And it was a really interesting talk, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. So, so how many participants are there in this session? I, I, I don't, I can't see. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, Hemant, uh, can you tell us about the number of participants? Uh, present? Yes, sir, the, so the participants are watching through the website. So, we okay. only the volunteers and the uh, are here present in the Zoom meeting. Okay. okay, so how do they interact? How, how, how do they ask questions? Uh, Sir, in the website, there is a Q&A chat box, so they can uh, chat there, ah, okay, so okay. we will yeah, get yeah. it here. Okay, so I, I have a question already. So sure. uh, I will just read it out. So the question is from Devarshi Devnath. So uh, the question is, in your evaporating drop experiments, there will be some spreading time of the droplet before the equilibrium contact line makes complete contact with the heated surface, how it will affect the total evaporation rate? That's a good question. So what we have done uh, for, for sessile droplets, what we have done is there are two different things what we have did. Uh, so one thing we did is we etched the surface to actually make sure that we have a pinned contact line. So, uh, so if you don't have a pinned contact line, we have done several experiments and simulations for that as well you will actually see the contact line move and there's no particular equilibrium contact angle, which is, which is a problem. So, uh, so with the diffuse interface method, there are two, there is uh, one, one small disadvantage is you can either do a completely pinned system or a completely moving system. We can't be in between. So we had to actually design our experiments in such a way that they are either completely moving or completely dynamic contact angle or completely fixed. So in case of those fixed experiments, we, we made sure that we have an etched ring. Uh, so, so, the, so the interface is completely pinned together. Is that, does that answer your question? Uh, Mr. Devarshi Devanath, uh, can you just uh, write if it answers your question? So we have done simulations where the systems are moving uh, and systems where the contact angle is complete, where the contact line is moving and we have evaluated the phase change. So we can see a distribution of, uh, distribution of phase change or rather uh, the evaporative flux with respect to the motion as well as with respect to the angle. So we have data on that as well. Okay, Hemant. Uh... Yeah. Is there any other questions? Uh, no, sir. No. Yeah. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, uh, let me ask you, I mean, uh, this is a very nice, interesting talk. And uh, I'm also, when you say that there is, uh, uh, you were concerned about the PIV uh, done inside the droplet. Uh, I also do have a lot of reservations on this, on that kind of results, because as you rightly pointed out, there could be interaction and the particles can definitely influence the flow. In fact, uh, it can influence the rate of evaporation as well. Yes. Yeah, so I think that uh, I'm really... Uh, it yeah, really... so we, we did find that, uh, we, we did find that as well, because when you have, so for example, if you have a, if you have a, a set of particles that are in a system which is binary, so you can have phase, uh, you can have one liquid and the other liquid, and basically if, so we have seen in some evaporation systems where your, your phases can actually separate out. So you can have the most volatile phase being, the most volatile liquid being thrown into one section of the droplet and the others being the less volatile liquid. So, but if you have particles in them, they tend to mix them again and again. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's what I meant by contamination. So, because we need to be very careful when we put these particles. 
if they if they're of a very very small size if they're of a very small size such that their inertia doesn't take into account much if they are very small size then probably there is they're okay but beyond a certain point i think uh, we should be very careful so uh, do you have any estimate of the size because see the when we do experiments we generally use fluorescent particles for that uh, yeah. uh, because uh, you know uh, otherwise there is a lot of uh, noise from different light sources and uh, you if you reduce the size of the particles then definitely the you know the intensity of the light reduces and the signal also reduces so yeah. i think uh, do you have any estimate like uh, the particle so, size so one thing one thing we know that for example uh, so what we have also done in that paper is uh, is rep reproducing chaos by virtue of the sphericity of the particle so what we have noticed is if your particle is more spherical is more if if it is more closer to a sphere then you have less amount of chaos okay then you have uh, then you have less propensity of chaos but if your particles actually deviate from being a sphere you actually increase the probability of having chaos more and more so one thing i would say is obviously most of these are standard particle sizes i know that but as long as they are in the as long as they are quite spherical you are probably in the region where you are not influencing you're not you're not in a region of where particle induced chaos comes into picture okay thank you yeah so i mean while i think uh, yeah so debarshi debanath he has said that he has got his answer so uh, so we'll just wait for another few questions and meanwhile uh, let me also ask you see this uh, the droplet i i agree with you that the, uh, you know the spherical droplet whether it is a sessile droplet or pendant droplet even a single component one can show a lot of uh, you know non axisymmetric uh, features within the uh, you know the flow inside the droplet yeah. uh, because uh, yeah so like you said the azimuthal asymmetry is really you know it uh, that that will always kick in and uh, that, that that that's something which we have all uh, i mean always seen in our experiments also see there is another thing like uh, when uh, the droplet evaporates it also creates a flow in the surrounding medium like yes. for example Uh, even for uh, water evaporating ssl droplet of water evaporating in a normal temperature say you know 25 degree centigrade okay so we see lot of this uh, plumes uh, yes. created in the surrounding medium okay yes. we we reported that results also with pendant droplet uh, mostly with pendant droplet yeah. so do you think that will play a role in the instability as well yes it plays a huge role uh, so in fact i've only showed you the part of the results which are in the liquid phase but if i show you the results for the gas phase as you rightly pointed there is a lot of activity going on in the gas phase and and the thing is uh, so one thing what we uh, when we do the stability analysis of the system one thing we do we make an assumption there is that the system is not very confined the system is open so what we hope is that the gas phase is not playing enough role to actually influence the stability again uh, okay so that is an assumption that we make but however if you have a very confined system for example if you are having in a in a heli shaw cell or whatever it is uh, ev evaporation then then definitely yes you would have the influence of uh, you uh, you would have the influence of uh, back forcing coming from the uh, uh, from from the gas phase and uh, and one of the things that we actually know that can happen is you have something called a shielding effect so wherein uh wherein the the vapor itself starts preventing further evaporation going on because it's saturated correct correct that's true it's called something like blowing effect or something yeah. in evaporation yeah sure so uh, there is another question from the uh, same uh, person devarshi devanath so he is asking did you observe formation of satellite droplets from top of the impacted drop while maintaining contact with surface did you observe capillary waves on drop periphery okay so so i should i should indicate that uh, so i think he is talking about uh, the the last videos i showed wherein uh, uh, we just put a droplet and it just spreads like that so in this case we have ensured that we are just very close to the surface so there is no inertia at all in terms of dropping the droplet so if we were at a higher elevation then obviously it would have formed a satellite droplet but 
these these simulations we are looking at extremely very gently dropped droplets okay so they're very close to the surface we just we just place them and then we leave so basically uh, so there is no satellite drop formation however there could be satellite drop formations not because of the inertial or the capillary forces but because of the marangoni instability that can kick off so you can you do see satellite droplets you can actually see that uh, these ethanol water droplets as they as they drop they form this octopus type of an instability and then you see these fingers and these fingers can leave behind droplets so i can call them as satellite droplets as well but they are more rich in water rather than um, rather than ethanol so but so you do get satellite droplets not because of capillary or not because of inertial motion as you see in impact systems uh, but this is because of marangoni thanks a lot so yeah uh, so my last question is uh, uh, this uh, droplets uh, the substrate the i mean the ethanol water droplet uh, it is dropped on a substrate which is at uh, ambient temperature or it is at a um, i think we have done several we have done it on uh, also on ambient i think we go up to 70 degrees or 50, 65 degrees um, okay. something like that so it's at a constant heated temperature substrate so we have gone from so if you look at the paper, recent jfm you will see that we have done it over a set of temperatures a big set of temperatures uh, i think we have also tackled we have gone i think uh, we have we have started from uh, 25 degrees to about 65 degrees or something like that so yeah okay so there is another question what are the values of equilibrium contact angle in your experiments oh that's a good question i need to look at the paper so uh, so the values of so in case of ethanol water we we wanted so one of the things we wanted to make sure is the theory that we developed was for flat droplets okay so your contact angle should be less than should be around 30 degrees or slightly less than that is good enough okay so uh, so in case of ethanol water we we managed to have so we we had to redesign the substrate in such a way that your contact angle is in that region so so i think for ethanol water you may have to look at the papers very carefully i don't remember the exact numbers so we have reported all those contact angles there so i think it would be in the region of 30 degrees in case of water it's the usual water on a copper substrate it's around uh, 50 degrees or something you can also look at the paper so it it, it would be there all of these things yeah yeah sure so uh, so thanks a lot and uh, probably uh, emant uh, should we close the session uh, yes, uh, yes sorry yes yeah so uh, thanks a lot professor prashant so it Thank was you. really yeah it was really nice to listen to you i am looking forward to read your papers also and uh, i'm sure we'll have an opportunity to meet sometime soon thank you so much thank you, thank you. So, so on much. behalf of uh, ichmt i'm i will uh, like to uh, thank you and uh, thanks a lot it's an honor to present to you thank you thank you so much thank you Uh, thank you sir thank you for uh, chairing the session and also one announcement sir to the audience so the plenary session by professor rajat mittal has already started so the audience are requested to join the plenary session thank you thank you very much thank you okay so we can leave now right emant please yeah yes thank sir you. yes yes thank sir you. thank, thank you, you very much, much.